Hi, I'm Huell Hauser, and this is Broadway in downtown Los Angeles, one of our city's most interesting and historic streets. Now, I say interesting because all the big new office buildings, all the big new skyscrapers are just over this way a few blocks. But in the middle of all this development, Broadway has remained kind of the way it's always been. There's a lot of charm and flavor and grit and grime and hustle bustle going on here all the time. This has traditionally been one of our city's most important streets. Lots of retail business going on here from its earliest days. And when you come down here on the weekends, it's still hard to find a place on the sidewalk. There are so many shoppers down here going about their business. Now this street is also the location of some of our city's finest treasures. And I say treasures because I'm talking about the wonderful old movie theaters located on Broadway. Now these theaters were built back in the days when they knew how to build buildings. And they were so magnificent and so beautiful and they had so much money put into them that they were literally called movie palaces. Now many of these movie palaces are long gone. But the good news is that many of these beautiful buildings are still here even though their future is very much in doubt. So what we're going to do in this particular program is go up and down Broadway and visit some of these magnificent old movie palaces and find out, if we can, just exactly where these old buildings fit into the future of our city. I'm here with Hillsman Wright. Hillsman, you are the president of, uh, former president of the Los Angeles Historic Theater Foundation and an outgoing board member of the League of Historic American Theaters. And when you talk about historic theaters, Downtown Los Angeles has them in spades, don't we? Uh, we have one of the, uh, the finest collections, not only in this country, but in the world. Really? Uh, I think only New York and London have more historic theaters this close together. Now, these theaters were built when? From about 1910, when the entertainment district moved west from Main Street over to Broadway until the last one on the street was built in 1931. Okay, now we're on 9th and Broadway, and the first one we're looking at is United Artists. Right, uh, which was always considered too far on the far end of Broadway to do much business. But uh, it did quite well when it opened in the late 20s. It was Mary Pickford's Theater, and uh, it's an extraordinary theater. And how is it being used today? Uh, it's one of the happy, happy spots on Broadway. As Dr. Gene Scott has restored it, is using it on Sundays as um, a broadcast center for his program, so it's seen all over the world now. Okay. Now, you pointed out this other one over here. The That's the uh, Embassy Hotel and Auditorium. That was originally built as a Methodist auditorium, and the Methodists were liberal in those days, and most of the major early union organizing activities happened on that stage in that theater. Um, it's much more an auditorium as opposed to a theater, but it's still nicely intact and waiting to be used. And we are standing in front of one of the real gyms, right? Right. This is uh, the Orpheum, the last of four Orpheum theaters uh, built in Los Angeles. This one was 1926. And it's a 2,400-seat theater that's a real treasure, just as nice now as the day it opened in 26. So it is still operating? Yes, it is operating as a movie house successfully and uh, as a site for live performances uh, that don't happen frequently enough. Okay. So that one's operating, and it's usually uh, with Spanish-speaking films, or? Right. Uh, action pictures with Spanish subtitles. Okay. Uh, it's a formula that's worked pretty well. Now, Broadway was the theater district in the 20s and 30s. Broadway was the theater district and the shopping district. And that's part of the reason both theater buildings and shopping buildings are here. They fed off of each other. So we have the May Company, Bullock's in the middle of the block, and the Broadway down at the end. So this was... What was what building? This was the May Company. Oh, this was the May Company right over here. And when it was built at the turn of the century, it was the finest department store building west of Chicago. It was huge, over a million square feet. Well, it's still a beautiful building. Take a look at it. It is absolutely wonderful. Great architecture. 
tremendous architecture, but something else that's very important in cities now is wide open spaces on the inside that are just waiting to be converted to other uses. So you mean it's sitting there basically empty now? There is a retail on the ground floor and some upstairs garment shops, but for the most part it's an empty building. And here we are at the Rialto Theater, which I guess was another fine theater? This one was a small theater uh, Sid Grauman built, and he had orchestras. It was a gag orchestra kind of place. Kay Kaiser and his College of Musical Knowledge might play here. And look at it now. It's totally gone. Well, not totally gone. Um, we landmarked the marquee, and there is a box office, believe it or not, behind uh, that clothing there. Right here? Yeah. See the spelling? There's a there. box office back there? Do you run this place? I sure do, yes. Well, where is the box office? Well, we have clothing over here right now, but... Uh, so you've got it some tickets here. covered with clothing. Oh, yeah. But under... Can we look? Yes, please. Small place. Well, you're operating in what yes. was once a fine old theater. How do you feel about that? Well, everybody... I, I guess, you know, I've, uh, what do you call it? I, uh, everybody come and take pictures here, you know, all the tourists come down here. Yeah, we get a lot of tourists down here. A lot of people wanting to see the old theater. Oh, yeah. They come and they touch the marbles down here. Yes. They touch the marble? Yeah. They sure do. Well, there's not much left, just the marquee and the oh, yes. ticket office, which is all covered up. Yeah, well, you know, we have to sell clothing, too, so I, there's nothing I can do. Well, yeah. nice to have met you. Thank you very much. We'll continue our tour. So this has been adapted. What happened is the uh, interior has essentially been bulldozed down to the bare concrete walls. So there really is nothing left of the auditorium at all. Uh huh. Now, uh, what about this? This is the Tower Theater. This is the Tower. This is S. Charles Lee's first theater. He was a very young man in his late 20s when he talked Gumbiner into letting him build it for him. It was to have been designed after the Paris Opera. He wanted a lobby that was marble and crystal and gold and gilt, but he also had a very long and narrow lot. He wanted real estate, real estate space. So what you have inside is a very grand lobby with a stained glass window, feels very much like the Paris Opera, but this long, narrow auditorium that seats about a thousand on the now, inside. But it's closed up. It's been closed up for five or six years. Uh, What's in there now? Uh, nothing. It's used primarily as a film location. Uh, Mambo Kings was photographed But here. I mean, it's been gutted, or is it still in its original? The seats have been taken out of the orchestra level. Uh, most of the light fixtures have been removed. But uh, for the most part, it's all there, just waiting yeah. to uh, find another light. Is this the one that when you're driving down, you can see the? Yeah, this is the one. Look at this, Louis, from the side. The, the, uh, the architecture of the side of this building is spectacular. Look at this. Uh, as Charles Lee believed that the show began on the sidewalk, and that included the terrazzo floor you walked on, the marquee, and especially the exterior of the theater. Um, you can notice up on tops of the windows there is a young starlet looking at her image in a mirror and a director clasping a camera and a megaphone. Um, both of them are unclothed, which was very daring for 1927. <laughs> and look at this, this whole side of the theater, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's closed up, been closed up, and you'll notice at the top, they never wasted a square inch of space on these buildings. You see newsreel kind of burning through. They had a large theater advertising for other theaters on the street, so they used every bit of space on the building, not for this theater, but for the other theaters, too. Was there a lot of competition among the theaters to see which ones could be the grandest? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, it was actually what uh, bankrupted a man down here. Mr. Gumbiner, who built the tower, also built the Los Angeles. And the historians will remember that at those days, the studios owned their own theaters. So they would make the movies, they would book them in their own theaters and control how they were played out to the public. Gumbiner believed that he could make a theater that was so elegant that it couldn't be ignored and that they would be forced to put their products in his theater. Uh, it didn't work. He went bankrupt a year after he opened the Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, now here's the Globe. The Globe dates back uh, even earlier to the teens. 
It was built as the Morosco Theater, and yes, that's the same Morosco as in New York City, Oliver Morosco. And we believe it's the last standing Morosco Theater. The one in New York City was demolished for the Portman Hotel. Now it, too, has become a t-shirt shop here. Uh, yes, another swap meet. And it was when this theater closed and the tower closed that the Theater Foundation was formed. You got nervous about we got what was happening. got very nervous. That was more theaters that had closed in one year than any time since the Depression on Broadway. And unfortunately, we were right, as one theater after another has closed in the last six, seven years. You're seeing things going downhill. Things are definitely going downhill. Well, you look at the economic figures from Broadway, and I mean, it's uh, 10 o'clock Monday morning. This place is hopping. On Saturdays and Sundays, you can't walk the sidewalks. There's so many people here. So economically, Broadway is doing great guns. It's just that the theaters aren't making it. Right. And, you know, these theaters were filled with patrons until about nine or ten years ago. Um, what Spanish? happened? That's a good question, Huel. I know Bruce Corwin has asked that question a hundred times, publicly and privately. Bruce Corwin is... His, his family basically uh, owned and operated these theaters, the Metropolitan Theater chain. And Bruce basically has seen his audience drop from being able to fill 12 of these theaters to now barely taking care of four of them. And, you know, he's, we've heard the uh, penetration of video in the Latino market, uh, the bad quality of Spanish language films because of the recession in Mexico, uh, the increased Americanization of uh, Latino families, um, not being interested in coming to Broadway, but going to the suburbs, Huntington Park, that sort of thing. Just any and all the reasons, but whatever the reasons are, the, the fact remains that there's way too many seats and not enough people to go in them. Yeah, so all of these great, wonderful movie palaces, because that's what they were when they were built, are in big trouble. If they're not already gone, they could be gone very quickly. And they could be gone unless we can wise up and find some other ways to use them. And that's why the Theater Foundation has been working so hard, the Conservancy is working so hard, is there are a lot of alternative uses for these buildings that haven't been tried yet. And okay, now wait a minute, we're right across the street from the State Theater. Was that one of the old ones? State's uh, 1921, I believe, uh, was MGM's low State, where all the major films played. It's 2,400 seats, it's the biggest theater remaining down here. There are 2,400 seats behind that little marquee? Yes. Because when you walk by here, you would almost miss it completely. Well, if you'd walk by here yeah, a few decades ago, there was another marquee on 7th Street and another entrance. This has always been such a successful theater. They needed two box offices to take all the money and get all the people in and out. 2,400 seats in the State Theater. 2,400. Now, it's still going. You got Beverly Hills Cop and Dracula. Is that in Spanish subtitles? Or? No, I don't believe they are. I believe these are uh, straight on, first run kind of show. English. Yeah. Okay, now here's the old Clifton's Cafeteria, which was another landmark place on Broadway that, that did a big business. And it still does a big business. Yeah. Um, it's, it's part of what, what I call the theme park aspect of the street. I mean, where else can you go in and, and get a great lunch for less than $5, have a waterfall cascading down by you while a buck is standing in the corner in the middle of a bunch of trees? It's, yeah. uh, talk about out of Disneyland. <laughs> well, look at all the people. The place is bustling. I interrupted you a minute ago when I saw the State Theater. You were talking about coming up with ways to use these theaters to make them work. Well, here it's, you know, over 200 of these theaters in cities all over the country and Canada have been brought back to life. Many times in neighborhoods that were far worse than Broadway uh, ever dreamed about being. And the way it was done, basically, was to put things on these stages and on the screens that people wanted to see. Mm -hmm. Things that they couldn't get anywhere else. Obviously, if you can drive five minutes to see a movie in your neighborhood, there's no incentive to come down here for 45 minutes and park and deal with all of that. 
So really movies, while they should be a part of the future of this area, are not going to be it. That's not what's going to get people back down into these theaters. So we think it has to be live events.